Hello and welcome to episode 34 of the Abyssinian History Podcast, an audio platform to examine pre-modern Islamic, Islamic history and a global medieval past. And our second instalment of a 12-part series entitled A Spring of Classical Arabic Poetry with Dr. Kevin Blankenship at Brigham Young University in Utah, part 8, Abu Firas al-Hamadani. 932 to 968 common era the prison poetry of a prince we are sponsored by ihrc bookshop listeners get a 15 percent discount on all purchases visit ihrc bookshop at shop.ihrc.org and use discount code ahp15 at checkout terms and conditions apply contact ihrc bookshop for details i'm your host Allah Hassan, a phd student at the school of oriental and african studies in london now on to the show. Al Harith bin Abi Al Ala Sa'id ibn Hamdan Al Taghlibi, better known by his nom de plume Abu Firas al Hamadani, was an Arab prince and poet. He was a cousin of Saif al Dawla, the ruler of northern Syria, whom he mentioned in episode 33. Abu Firas is best known for the collection of poems entitled Arumiyat during his time as a prisoner of war with the Byzantines. To discuss with me the life, work and legacy of Abu Firas is Dr. Kevin Blankenship. Welcome Dr. Blankenship. Hi Talha, very good to be with you. Abu Firas al-Hamadani was born at a time when the Abbasid Caliphate was beholden to de facto autonomous dynasties and facing a Byzantine foe. What do we know about Abu Firas's socio-political context? Abu Firas was nearly an exact contemporary of Al-Mutanabbi. And so a lot of what goes for Al-Mutanabbi's time, which we discussed in the last episode of this series, a lot of what goes for Al-Mutanabbi's time and place, we can also say about Abu Firas. This was an age of political and social turmoil. Within Abu Firas's lifetime, the Cordoban Umayyads in Spain declared a new caliphate, and the Fatimid Ismaili Shiite caliphate conquered Egypt and built Cairo as their capital. And between these two caliphates and the Abbasid caliphate at Baghdad, there were several rump states between them that represented spheres of influence that the different caliphates and, and great powers, if you will, were v- trying to bring within their sphere of orbit. And they included the North African Zirids, and and the Hamdanids in northern Syria caught between, you know, the Fatimids at Cairo and the Abbasids at uh, at Baghdad in particular. Another big thing, probably the big thing that marked this time and that affect Abu Firas especially were the Arab-Byzantine Wars. These were a series of armed conflicts between a number of Muslim Arab dynasties in the Byzantine Empire between the 7th and 11th centuries Common Era. And they started because with the expansion of the Islamic realm, beginning in the 630s, Byzantium's southern provinces in Syria and Egypt were captured by the caliphate. And over the next 50 years under the Umayyad caliphs, the Arabs would go on to launch repeated raids into still Byzantine Asia Minor. Uh, And they twice besieged the Byzantine capital of Constantinople and conquered the Byzantine exarchate of Africa. So during these first centuries, the Byzantines were normally on the defensive in these conflicts. And only in 740 or so did they start going on the attack. They started raiding and trying to get back these territories that had been captured. And often this counter raiding and counter attacking resulted in massive retaliations from the Abbasids. And speaking of the Abbasids, under their rule, relations became mm, somewhat more normal with embassies being exchanged and even periods of truce. But overall, conflict remained the norm with almost annual raids and counter raids, which were sponsored either by the Abbasid government or by local local rulers. And this happened well into the 10th century. The last century or so of the Arab-Byzantine Wars was dominated by frontier conflicts with the Fatimids in Syria. But the border remained stable until the appearance of a new people, the Seljuk Turks, uh, after 1060. These wars had a profound impact on the Arab-Muslim imagination aside from sort of the political and military implications. And there are many examples of this that show up in classical Arabic texts, and, and including 
belletristic literature. So, for example, in one of the maqamat of the 12th century government official Al-Hariri, and this is the Al-Maqama Al-Haramiya, said to be the first maqama that Al-Hariri wrote, the premise of the tale is that an eloquent beggar appears in Basra claiming that his daughter had been taken by invading Byzantines. Another example is in the Thousand and One Nights, the 13th night, including part of the tale of the King Yunan and the sage Duban, the king's conniving vizier tells him that Duban, a sage who has come and offered to heal the king, is from Byzantium and therefore not to be trusted. And then, of course, one of the starkest examples in literature is the long prose work of Abu Ala al Ma'ari called The Epistle of the Horse and the Mule, Risalat as Sahil wa Shahij. And a large part of the second half, or you know, maybe last third of this work, is uh, it, it involves reports by a fox who comes and talks about the panic or jafla of the people of Aleppo and northern Syria generally at the prospect of Byzantine invasion. And so again, there's this sort of like the Byzantine empire as prestige enemy image in that shows up in these sort of literary texts that speaks to a broader concern on the part of, uh, of Arabs and Muslims and people in their, in their realm at this time. Abu Firas al-Hamadani was born a prince, lived a while as a prisoner, and was killed as a provocateur against a rival ruler, his own nephew, in fact. What do we know about Abu Firas al-Hamadani's own life? Abu Firas was born to a Greek slave girl, an Um Weled, meaning that she was freed after giving birth to her master's child. His father was Abu Ala Said ibn Hamdan, uh, and he this was a provincial governor, a military leader, and cousin of the Emir Saif al-Dawla, who Abu Firas would later go on to uh, to join his court. He, meaning Abu Firas's father, was killed in 935, and this happened during a dispute over possession of Mosul with his nephew, Nasr al-Dawla. And Abu Firas's mother fled to the protection of Nasr al-Dawla's brother, Saif al-Dawla. And so when Saif al-Dawla occupied Aleppo and northern Syria in 944-945 Common Era, he welcomed Abu Firas to his court. And there Abu Firas was raised under the supervision of Saif al-Dawla, who also married his sister. And aside from being a renowned warrior, as many listeners will be familiar with, Saif al-Dawla was famous for being a patron of scholars and poets. Uh, And the young Abu Firas therefore grew up in a culturally vibrant atmosphere, which saw assembled at Aleppo some of the finest minds of the Muslim world. He was familiar with the preacher Ibn Nubata, the philosopher and musician Al-Farabi, and the great poet Al-Mutanabbi, while the grammarian Ibn Khalaway was Abu Firas's tutor. And all of these people figure into sort of later episodes in this poet's life as well as in Al-Mutanabbi's life. Abu Firas was appointed governor of Manbij, in 947 or 948 Common Era, and took part in the wars with Byzantium. And he proved himself on the battlefield as a warrior, but also as a poet. He was twice taken captive, to go back to the point you brought up, Talha, about his most famous poetry written in while incarcerated. In 959 was the first time he was held at uh, the Kharshana fortress, where he later escaped, and in 962, when he was detained for four years in Byzantium itself. According to the biographer Ibn Khal Khan, Abu Firas was first captured by the Byzantines in 959, as I mentioned, and escaped captivity by jumping into the Euphrates. Uh, but this tale is dismissed by some modern commentators. Most sources place his capture at 962, and the Byzantine general Theodore Parsakotinos led a raid of 1,000 or 1,300 men in the vicinity of Menbij, where Abu Firas was governor, when Abu Firas set out with only 70 men to obstruct their plundering and raiding, and he was captured. After his release of this four-year incarceration the second time, Abu Firas was restored to his position and named governor of Homs, but the situation was rapidly changing. Less than a year after he got out of prison, Saif Adola died, and the Hamdanid emirate of Aleppo fell apart. Abu Firas fought with Saif al-Dawla's 15-year-old heir, Abu al-Ma'ali, the son of Abu Firas's own sister, Sakhina. Uh, and he raised a rebellion in Homs over the matter, but Abu Firas overestimated the support that he had among those Arab tribes. And Abu Firas, after revolting against his nephew, was defeated and killed 
in 968 by Abu Ali's general Farah Away, in some sources Qadah Away. Abu Firas was 36 years old when he was killed, and at the news of his death, Abu Firas's sister was reportedly so overcome with grief that she plucked out one of her own eyes. Abu Firas al Hamadani is best known for the collection of poems entitled Arumiyat uh, during his time as a prisoner of war with the Byzantines. Tell us more about this work and his other works more generally. Abu Firas's Diwan was edited by his tutor, the grammarian Ibn Khalaway. Listeners will recall this Ibn Khalaway from the episode on al Mutanabbi, who famously insulted Ibn Khalaway's lack of grammar knowledge with an ethnic slur on his Persian identity. And interestingly, also, this edition made by Ibn Khalaway includes a commentary principally by the poet himself. We're, li- we're talking about a time now when sort of bookishness overall lent itself to more self-commentary, which you start to see, especially like in the ninth, but even more so in the 10th century and thereafter. And so this is one example of, uh, of that phenomenon. The complex manuscript tradition was amply documented by Sami Dahan in his edition, which is the best edition. And the most important component of Abu Firas's corpus in a literary historical sense, as you mentioned, Talha, are the Rumiyat. And these are the poems composed during his four-year imprisonment in Byzantium. And they're mostly addressed to Saif ad asking for him to pay the ransom, although some were also dedicated to his mother, his brother, and friends. The tone of these odes changes, switches between resignation and defiance. And throughout, the poet never loses his sense of the form. And these are these poems are models of sophisticated composition. They're very nice to read. This combination of emotion expressed through convention, connected with sort of an intellectual toying with the form of the, the Qasida ode, is very typical of, of Abu Firas. Besides Saif Adela, the other person Abu Firas addresses most often in his rumiat is his mother. She was his staunchest advocate at home and tried more than once to intercede on his behalf to get him out of prison, although these attempts don't seem to have worked. Abu Firas expresses his gratitude to her in several poems, but the most moving one he wrote to his mother was the elegy on her death. And in that poem, he repeats the refrain, mother of the captive, over and over again. Mother of the captive, may a strong rain slake your thirst. It was despite your effort that the prisoner met his fate. Mother of the captive, let a strong rain water your thirst. He is confused, not able to stand or move. Mother of the captive, let a strong rain water your thirst. To who shall the bearer of good news bring good news of my ransom? Mother of the captive, let a strong rain slake you since you've gone. Who will the captive's locks grow for? This poem always reminds me of a modern counterpart, uh, a rap song by the Palestinian rap group Dam. And the song is called Risala Min Zinzane, or a letter from a prison cell, from an incarcerated son to his mother. And it's actually a dialogue, him talking to her from prison and her talking about how she'll weep for him and wait for him to be let out. You know, it, it, Abu Firas lived, of course, at a particular time and place, but the 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 sentiment and uh, the emotions that he expresses resonate throughout time and throughout different traditions. Abu Firas was also a staunch partisan for the Hamdanids, which as many listeners will know was a 12er Shiite dynasty. And Therefore, Abu Firas was also not fond of the Abbasids. And for this reason, one remarkable item in Abu Firas's diwan is this monumental qasida of over 200 verses celebrating the Hamdanid dynasty. There's also several Shiite propagandist odes, the most significant one being an anti-Abbasid pro-Alid manifesto of about 60 lines. In fact, in one poem that Abu, where Abu Firas begins by reminiscing about a drinking party where he fell madly in love with one of the participants, he suddenly shifts to an invocation of the sufferings of Hussein on the day he was killed by Umayyad forces in the desert near the town of Karbala. I am forbidden to come close to him, just as Hussein was forbidden water when he saw it. When he said, give me something to quench my thirst, he was given spears to drink instead of the fresh water that would have satisfied him. And then a head was hacked that had long been held sacrosanct because the fronts and backs of his grandfather's hands had held it close. A day that had been in God's eye, or rather God dictated it should be, because of the tyranny of the tyrants. Such it was. If only he had destroyed the enemies of the prophet, the possessor of the throne, then the prophet would not have known enemies. A day when the morning sun changed to black and wept blood on account of what the heavens saw. 
There was no excuse for a soul not to break into tears or for one weeping not to find those tears overflowing his eyes. May a people perish who have followed their passions on a course whose outcome one day would lead them to evil. In addition to the Rumiat and these sort of proto or pro Shiite leaning verses, Abu Firas wrote a well known hunting poem in the Rajas meter, and it's an Urjuza Muzdawija, meaning composed in the Rajas meter in couplets, uh, of about 137 lines, which many see as a masterpiece of the hunting poem genre, the Tardiya. And just a couple of lines from that, he says, let me describe a day that passed in Syria, the most enjoyable I have ever known. I summoned the hawk master one day when I awoke at dawn from my sleep. I said to him, pick seven older ones, each a noble willing to drink the dust. Two of them would be devoted to the rabbit. The other five set aside for gazelles. Form the hunting dogs into two teams that you will send out two by two. And do not keep back the tracking hounds, for they shall be the coup de gras of the gazelles already wounded. Uh, in addition... Abu Fidas also penned a number of epigrams, which are descriptive and sort of have gnomic wisdom in them, and then over a hundred erotic pieces, which are mostly short, rarely beyond five or six verses. So I'll end this section by quoting a couple of lines that Abu Fidas wrote to his daughter while he was awaiting his return to Aleppo and before he was put to death by Abu Ma'ali's general Fadrawe. It's kind of a self elegy, if you want to think of it that way. Daughter dear, do not show your sorrow. All human beings must prepare to leave this earth. Daughter dear, patience is beautiful for someone who would stand above the blows of misfortune. Weep for your father, mourn him, but from behind your curtain and veil. When you call for me and I don't reply, then say, the ornament of youth, Abu Firas, did not have much joy in his own youth. So Hamilton Alexandra Roskin Gibb, the Orientalist, praises Abu Firas al Hamadani's work for its, quote, sincerity, directness, and natural vigor, end quote. How would you characterize Abu Firas al-Hamadani's legacy? So Abu Firas is still considered a native son of Syria today. In fact, I'm looking at a postage stamp right now with his face on it. And according to Professor Gibb, as you mentioned, his personal traits, as much as anything else, helped to spread his reputation from his noble descent, his fair appearance, to his bravery and generosity, to his tendency to egotism and overreaching ambition. To quote Professor Gibb, he lived up to the Arab ideal of chivalry, which he expressed in his poetry. This is the kind of thing, to hear this praise of Abu Firas, that would have infuriated his rival al Mutanabi, who fancied himself a brave warrior and the epitome of Arab identity. On another note, the Rumiat are one of our most important sources on the life of Saif ad and the Byzantine Arab Wars of that period. And four sections of his work are of particular interest, a historical piece narrating the role of the Hamdanids in the Islamic world, especially against the Byzantines, two poems for campaigns in 950 and 958, respectively, and then a poem composed during his captivity in the capital where he met with Nikephorus Phocas. Abu Fidas, of course, was an eyewitness to many of the events that he describes in these poems. But he also must have had access to con other contemporary witnesses, especially at the Hamdanid court. And these included his cousins and maybe some sort of archival material in Aleppo. There's a, a great book that came out in 2018 by Georgios Theotokos called Byzantine Military Tactics in Syria and Mesopotamia in the 10th Century. And in chapter 9, he describes... Abu Fidas's sources as, as one of several that are important for this period for the military history of, of Arab Byzantine engagements. In addition to that book, some other further readings that I can recommend are Terry de Young's entry on Abu Fidas in Essays in Arabic Literary Biography, the second volume, 925 to 1350. There's a, a monograph in German in 1895 by uh, Dvorak called Abu Fidas, ein arabischer Dichter und Held. And then um, a couple of articles by Suzanne Stetkevich and Yaroslav Stetkevich. Suzanne has a professor Stetkevich has an article called Performative Poetics in Abbasid Poetry, a rereading of Abu Firas al Hamdani's Ra'iya, Araka Asiya Demi. And then uh, Professor Yaroslav Stetkevich has uh, a chapter in his book, The Hunt in Arabic Poetry, which was came out in 2016. And that's chapter seven where he talks about that. And finally, let's end with a sample of the original Arabic from our poet and the translation. 
This poem is the famous Ra'iya by Abu Firas, so written during his incarceration. And I'll read from the translation by Suzanne Stakevich. One thing that sets this poem apart is that most of his Rumiat poems were um, addressed to say Fidela to press him to ransom Abu Firas, his captive kinsman, and uh, and otherwise to reproach him for not doing so, for being slow to do so. And so therefore, they one would classify these as kind of praise poems to say Fidela and also kind of reproach Aritab, like the reproach of someone who is on your side. But this is his most consistently his most famous and popular poem, and it takes more of the form of a boast. So, um, you know, that sets it apart from some of these other Rumiat poems that, uh, that we mentioned. And so here it is. I see that your tears refuse to fall and that you are by nature steadfast, but does passion wield no power over you to forbid or to command? Of course, I'm filled with yearning and suffer the pangs of love, but a man like me does not broadcast his secrets. But when night weakens my resolve, I unclench the passion's fist and I humiliate with profuse weeping those tears that were too proud to flow. In a fire so bright, when my passion and my thoughts ignited, it nearly grow, it nearly glows right through my ribs. She makes me hope in vain for union, though death stands between us. If I die thirsting, may no rain ever fall again. I preserve, but let you perish the love between us. You proved better at excuses than at loyalty. These days are nothing but pages whose letters are erased by the same hand that wrote them. May my soul be the ransom of that tender girl of the tribe that departed at morn. My love for her was my sin, her beauty, my excuse. She furtively attends to what my slanderers say, while my ear is deaf to all who would defame her. I've become like a Bedouin, though my tribe are still settled for me to an abode where her tribe does not dwell is a desert. I fought my own tribe over my love for you, though but for my love for you we'd mix like wine and water. Even if what my slanderers said were true, and it's not, your faith should have destroyed the infidel edifice of lies. I was loyal, though sometimes loyalty can cause humiliation, to a girl in the tribe who was by nature treacherous. At times she dignified through youthful passion, stirred her, though youthful passion stirred her veins. At other times she frolicked like a frisky colt. And I'm skipping ahead a couple of lines. Were not for you, sorrows would have found no way to my heart, but love is a bridge that leads to ruin. So I was certain that after my humiliation, no lover would ever attain honor and that my hand was empty of what it had once grasped. I turned the matter over in my mind, but found no rest. When other cares made me forget, separation implored to remember. So I submitted once more to the rule of fate and to her rule. Hers is the sin which will never be punished. Mine, the apology. As if I were trying to call from the across the earth, soft earth at the wadi's mouth, a tawny gazelle, a tremble with fear, now starting with fright, then drawing near as if to call her still wobbly legged fawn in the wadi's bed. For I am the one who seeks every battalion accustomed to victory and never forsaking it. For I am the one who attacks in every dreaded land full of hostile glances for those that alight there. I go thirsty till the swords and spears have quenched their thirst. I go hungry till the vulture and the wolf have had their fill. I don't attack at dawn a helpless tribe whose men are gone, nor do I attack any army without giving warning first. And yet on how many an impregnable abode that did not fear me have I with daybreak wreaked destruction. How many a tribe did I drive back its horsemen until I owned it, defeated, though the veils and curtains of its womenfolk drove me back? How many a captive damsel trailing the trains of her gown toward me did I meet, and yet in me no man harsh or rude received her? I bestowed upon her all that the army had plundered, yet no veil of hers was rent. Wealth with its spended robes has not corrupted me, nor has want turned me away from generosity. What need have I of money that I should desire its abundance? If I have not gained abundant honor, then let my money not abound. I was taken captive, though my comrades weren't unarmed. My battle steed was no untrained colt, nor its master an untried youth. But once fate sets its sights upon a man, no land or sea can have him. My closest comrade said, flee or die. What a choice, I replied. Even the sweeter one is better. I would rather take the blameless path and fight. I'll take my chances and either be killed or better yet, captured. They say to me, you have sold safety for death. By God, I replied, I have not lost in the exchange, for even if I can escape captivity and harm, how long can I escape death? It's no good to repel death with shameful deeds, as Amr ibn al-As did with exposing his private parts to Ali. My captors obliged me, not by stripping me of my gear, for I had nothing but my battle garb soaked red with their blood. 
and the hilt of my sword, whose blade had broken off in their flesh, and the shaft of my lance, whose point was broken off in them. My tribe will remember me when trouble breaks out, for in the darkest night, the full moon is missed. If I live, I'll be at their side with my attack they know so well, the spears, the blades, and the slender roans. And if I die, well, every man must die, though his days be long and his lifetime be extended. Dr. Blankenship, thank you again. Thank you, Talha.